Are, are you going to give me a signal? Okay. Welcome back to our second session of the afternoon, Friday afternoon, Tesla Tech. We're uh, going to be involved, in, continue our uh, involvement with, uh, actually, this really fits in more with yesterday's uh, theme, which was having to do with electrogravitics and things related to that. But uh, our speaker, by the way, uh, Mark Sokol, was originally scheduled for 1 o'clock. He's now speaking at 2.30, and the speaker that was going to speak at 2.30, Thorsten Ludwig, isn't here. However, his substitute is going to speak tomorrow at 1 o'clock. So I hope that all makes sense. And I just thank everyone who uh, has been flexible on this so much. We're not too far behind schedule, so thank you, everyone. Dr. Maury King will be speaking at uh, something close to 4 o'clock. So we should be uh, close to on schedule at that point. Uh, and uh, Mark Sukol is 33 years old, and so this is going to be a special treat, I think, for the younger folks in this in this group. And I can't I can't emphasize this enough how important it is that we have young people involved in what we're doing. Thank you for yeah, that's absolutely true. And uh, some people, like uh, the, the couple speakers ago, said that he got his inspiration actually from this conference, Ralph Sudeth said that and that was really cool he came to his first one at age 27 and and he is not only has he been successful in doing the things he's done he's actually made money at it and that's pretty cool and i like i really like seeing that i just want to make a point in that it, that in this world if you are able to come up with some ideas and actually bring them into fruition there's plenty of money out there in order to support that kind of research if you if you've got good ideas and you can actually make them happen and this man is an as an excellent uh, example of just that very thing. He's 33 years old, and he didn't really get interested in this at all until a couple of years ago. And now he's just uh, setting the world on fire. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mark Sokol. He's self-taught, first of all, like many people in this room. And in fact, everyone in this room, even if you have a PhD, I know you're self-taught in this kind of stuff because you're not going to learn this at any university. And that's just the truth. But he's self-taught, and he actually, I, I don't want to get too deep into this, but he actually started off with having a, a religious uh, debate with some of his Jewish friends. And he said he didn't agree with the Jewish religion because of its belief in, I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole, but having to do with aliens and things like that. And he was uh, trying to, to prove a point about that and ended up in uh, anti-gravitics. Uh, which was a really interesting way to go. And, and then the more he studied that, the more he realized, hey, you know what, I can change the world. I can do something really seriously important with this work. And so he just went in 110%. And let me tell you some of the things he did. First of all, I thought it was fascinating. He told me a couple nights ago about the Alzafon effect, and I'd never heard of it. And Lucian, uh, Dr. Lucian Ionesco is here. He just, he just mentioned it casually in another paper. It's like, when it's time to learn about something, you got, that's it. So I, now that's on my reading list. But anyway, he, uh, getting back to Mark, he's, uh, he has started something called the APAC Conference, which meets twice a week on Zoom. So if you want to be part of a really uh, dynamic group, get part of that APAC group. It's at altpropulsion.com, and it was put together by Tim Ventura. Hopefully that's a name that most of you know. He's been involved in anti-gravitics also for a very long time. And uh, Mark's also been working with uh, uh, Tony Robertson, who's uh, here, and I think he's, oh, there he is, and a couple of other people who are in this room. So uh, he is really setting the world on fire. He's got uh, I, just a little bit of his background. He, he uh, worked as a mechanic refurbishing hybrid car parts. And uh, he just saw a need and filled it. And I think that's so cool. That's the kind of guy he is. He sees what needs to be done, gets it done. He was working on Priuses and Camrys. Apparently, they, they, uh, they have a trouble with these batteries that are hard to replace. And then through that, he had, that gave him the background in, it, in order to be able to do the kind of work that he's going to be doing. He's been working on, uh, he's replicated several experiments already, the Boyd-Bushman effect. He's replicated the Beefield-Brown effect, the TT-Brown. And now he's really uh, involved in getting going with this Elzefon effect. And that's, I think, what he's going to be be talking about today. And I'll just finally say his name is Mark Sokol, and Sokol in, I believe it's Slavic, means Falcon. And that is where this name Falcon Space comes from. So please give a warm welcome to Mark Sokol. Okay, um, thank you very much for waiting. I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, we have to transfer over some files to a different format. And uh, we're ready to go. So Falcon Space, it's uh, not officially a company yet, but it is a, uh, a dream that we have to advance anti-gravity technology. Um, and by advancing, um, by anti-gravity, I mean however those flying saucers operate. You, know, you don't have to take it in the literal sense. 
Um, and one of the ways to do that is to both report on the positive results that we've had and the negative results that we've had, because a lot of people gloss over that how many times you fail until you finally achieve the light bulb. It's really a thousand failures. Uh, so our team, and uh, this is a, a, a loose construct of a team. If I can get this to work. Um, Bob, I think uh, there's something in the way there. Okay. Okay, so we got uh, Jeremy Reese, who's a uh, YouTube personality, alien scientist. He's been like a lightning rod for this uh, industry, uh, for the younger folk at least, um, connecting all of us together. He connected me with uh, Jeremiah Pop, who's over here on the right. Um, we met up in the lab, uh, which is in Hawthorne, New Jersey, which is uh, kind of interesting because uh, SpaceX is in Hawthorne, California, so we're in Hawthorne, New Jersey, like the SpaceX of the East. Um, this is uh, Aiden Schaefer, uh, the local, who, who, came, who came by and uh, helped out uh, when we got a CNC machine. Uh, there's also Aaron Kishler over there who's making a uh, documentary about the program. Uh, this is Tom Butler. He's a, uh, a local guy who uh, helps out with uh, brute force and lifting stuff. Um, we also have a, uh, a lab house with uh, guest bedrooms and stuff, so if anyone wants to stop by uh, Falcon Space Labs and, and work on stuff, we'll, uh, we'll be able to set you up. There's a, a Jeremy with his guitar. Um, we also uh, work remotely. Um, that You can see um, it's one, one of our friends from uh, Britain who has helped me on a project, and I snapped a picture of it. Uh, it's in the lab. Uh, this is Alex Jones. Not the Alex Jones. He's a different Alex Jones. He's a uh, software engineer, and uh, he knows how to how to work with software and hardware, uh, Arduino style stuff, and also uh, several different programs. And he's he's working with us on a uh, magnetic mapping device right now. He's also very interested in the gravity flyer. Um, uh, on the on the center is uh, Sam Thompson. That's somebody I met through APEC who came down to the lab for a week. Um, on the left is uh, Tom Butler again. And uh, that is our, uh, that's Pinky, the, uh, the lab dog. And she's trying to get out of her cage. Um, the uh, University of Albany Physics Department came down a couple weeks ago. They were very interested in the Alzafon experiment. Um, the guy on the right, uh, I think his name is Eric uh, Rafe, or something like that. Uh, he's actually an EPR expert. And he has like uh, a PhD in physics from before I was born. And he's never heard of the Alzafon experiment. I gave, gave him a copy of the book, and he's very interested in uh, seeing how it turns out. Um, and there's uh, John Brandenburg, when we met the first time at uh, AlienCon 2019. Um, here's just some more pictures from the lab. You know, I'll be getting, that's uh, Jeremiah Pop again. We were working on some experiment and had uh, earplugs on. Um, yeah, so we're pretty jovial uh, attitude over there. Uh, Jeremy comes down, he's a bit of a showman, and uh, he, he painted all that stuff on his van. It just makes, makes it a lot of fun. You know, science doesn't have to be so serious all the time. We can, we can have fun, too. Um, yeah, we got in trouble once. <laughs> no, that, that's a joke. Yeah, they, they, were, they were cool. They let us go. Uh, we also have uh, STEM clubs that actually came down to the lab a couple times. These are kids who are, they were building uh, ion craft. Uh, here's everyone inside the Faraday cage. Um, I think uh, teaching the next generation is very important to us because uh, they are our future. Uh, here's, uh, this is when I was back in the house. I was building ion craft using a, a bell-shaped design that I'll show you a little later. There's my uh, daughter. She was five at the time. She's teaching everyone how uh, electrohydrodynamics works. <laughs> okay, so the first experiment uh, that I worked on, this was about uh, two and a half years ago, was the Boyd-Bushman effect. Uh, inside that uh, tube over there, there is two very strong neodymium magnets that are forced together using a uh, aluminum rod with brass uh, nuts on it. It's a threaded rod. And uh, I, I made one, one that had the magnet in it and one that was a, um, a dummy. And uh, stuck it inside this apparatus. Uh, it, was, it sounded great in theory when I built it, but uh, as, when I started shaking it around, I quickly realized that those scales are not really suitable for this type of 
a setup I was planning on putting inside of a, uh, like a small airplane and taking a dive and see, uh, seeing what, what kind of results you'd get with it. Uh, for those who don't know, the Boyd Bushman effect is basically you stick two ma magnets in opposition and drop it, and it's supposed to slow, f uh, fall slower than gravity. Uh, a couple people have tried it. It probably works based on uh, the data that I've seen, but uh, there's no real way to uh, turn this into a you know, flying saucer or craft or anything. So uh, this thing was ended, up, ended up being taken apart, but this was a uh, failure. Um, this, this was uh, one of the other earlier experiments. You could, if you could just see that right over there, this was a, um, uh, basically a disc-shaped dielectric, and I put two electrodes on either side, and uh, got a couple of, of these uh, Tesla coil uh, voltage multipliers off of uh, Amazon uh, made out of Chinesium. And uh, when you power it up, it would start to move. It later turned out to just be ion, ion effects. Um, I also tried rectifying it using uh, X-ray uh, diodes. That's what you see here on this block of wood. Um, you know, looking back two years, I, I see a lot of mistakes in all these setups. So uh, that's pretty much what we're going to be doing here: is pointing out mistakes. Um, this was the uh, the first lab setup that I had. It was in my garage. Uh, I picked up a 125,000 volt power supply. Uh, off of the, um, the anti-gravity uh, uh, research store known as eBay. And uh, you set up this little uh, wire cage contraption here, um, spark. Um, it's basically it's some, some form of a Faraday cage. It doesn't protect you much from uh, the x-rays and a lot of other good stuff. Uh, so this is, this is one of the first setups. This was a really bad design. The amount of friction on here was uh, you know, would have negated any result that I would have seen. Uh, so I got rid of that at some point. Uh, so the, the idea was to create a slanted sawtooth wave at high voltage. That was one of the first ideas I had. It was based off of uh, Podklonov's impulse experiment, where he cl claimed that uh, for every multiplication of the, um, the voltage, you'd see a 10 times increase in the effect. And if you have this non nonlinear uh, effect that's going up with uh, 10 times for every two times voltage, that means that you can you can get a push out of it by having a faster impulse in one direction, a slower return impulse, uh, also known as the slanted sawtooth wave. Um, to achieve this, I was using uh, vacuum tubes. Um, again, I got those off of eBay, um, and I uh, wired up a whole circuit to both power the tubes independently off of a little battery and also uh, trigger them using a fiber optic circuit. And I'll show you that in a second. Uh, and then the, um, this was the end, uh, this, was the, this is where all the power was going into, is that uh, Townsend Brown inspired bowl, and there's a, uh, a dielectric underneath it and another, uh, I think it was a silver uh, contact on the bottom. And I'll show you, this is a video of that setup. If there's four of them in series. Can you turn off the audio a bit? Okay, so this is the first test of the full experiment. We have uh, four vacuum tubes independently powered with a lot of dielectric connected to a high voltage power supply which is putting out 125,000 volts maximum. Um, the diodes are being controlled via fiber optics via this uh, signal generator box. And there we have the subject, basically a copper cone on top of a Teflon uh, dielectric with a, a piece of silver at the bottom. And there's a little bearing titanate to make it into a bit of a capacitor. And then we have a scale at the bottom. It says 180, 184, that's grams. I don't know how accurate that scale is. Yeah, scale ended up being a problem. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh, I don't know if you could tell, but taking a video was secondary to getting the experiment going. So I'm basically using a, uh, a signal generator to light up a diode, which is feeding light through a, a bunch of fiber optic uh, cables and powering those four tubes uh, all in series to be able to control the maximum amount of voltage.
basically we, um, we ended up making a 70,000 volt uh, speaker. Okay, so okay, and this is a view from the bottom. It basically became a uh, 70,000 volt speaker. Um, we did see some weight loss on that scale, but I don't trust those numbers because the amount of EMF that was going on there was screwing with the scale for sure. Um, and we also discovered something else a little later. Can you uh, press play or is it on me? Oops. Oh, that was me. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, press play. The bottom view is pretty cool. You can see it lighting up. Notice the uh, the green light over here is working in tandem with the uh, with the sparks, and also you can see some of the fiber optic cables that are lighting up. So it shows that there was some control using the fiber optic system, but there was a couple mistakes that I made in this setup. Uh, namely, the uh, the tube didn't have the proper.